The United States government of today has been influenced by many things, but perhaps none greater than the influence of Greece. The story is set in 1959 where this American musical classic takes place. Wait, this can't be right. Uh, let's see where we're... Uh, yeah, yes, ancient Greece has had a tremendous impact on American society, creating all kinds of health problems for us here in the United States. Oh my gosh, guys, welcome back to Civics Review, and today we're going to be learning about ancient Greece, the country. And the reason we're doing this in civics class is because the United States, the formation of this country, and the government is really heavily influenced by this ancient culture. We love what they were doing, right? This word ancient means it comes from our past. And Greece was the country that sort of set the trends for what was cool and how to wear your hair and what your government could look like. And what they did 2,000 years ago really resonated with us when we were forming our nation. We wanted to look like them and walk like them. We wanted to smell like them. Yeah! So if you've ever wondered where the U.S. came up with ideas like constitutions and citizen participation, voting, and even the concept of a city having its own independent government, then look no further than the influences of ancient Greece. I do regret to inform you that we will not be looking and comparing the fashions of ancient Greeks and modern day Americans. I apologize in advance. So let's start with the first influence from ancient Greece, which was the polis. And this is the Greek word for city. Now, I'm not trying to say that Americans stole the concept of a city from the ancient Greeks. We're just trying to mention that city structures in America are very similar to the way they were structured in ancient Greece. Each polis had its own government, its own laws that were quite different from cities nearby, and they all had different requirements for how citizens should participate in their local governments. Now, the reason ancient Greece had cities that had their own governments and different laws everywhere you went was mostly based on their terrain. In the very mountainous regions of ancient Greece, it was very impractical for one government to rule over every spot on top of the mountain. And so you had places like Athens, which had its own government laws and citizen participation that was quite different from everyone around them, yet they remained a part of Greece the country. It works much the same way in the United States because, hey, we really wanted to be like ancient Greece. So let's take Florida for an example where we have the city of Tampa. They've got their own mayor. They have their own Tampa-specific laws. And of course, they have their own police force. The people of Tampa vote for these leaders. They participate in this government and they adhere to the laws and rules of the city. On the other coast, we have Miami. They've got different issues on the other coasts, and so they have their own mayor and their own laws and law enforcers to help deal with their specific issues. Both cities still fall under the jurisdiction of the state of Florida and of course belong to the greater authority of the country of the United States of America. Another big influence of ancient Greece on the USA was the idea of a constitution, and this is a written document that establishes how a government can function, and what kind of powers it has. Now the concept of writing down the rules for how the government should act and behave might not seem super special to you, but back in the time of the ancient Greeks, it was somewhat uncommon for a king or someone in charge of a country to actually write down the laws and the rules as well as the limitations of the government. Each polis had its own constitution because they had their own government, right? Athens had democracy, where people voted directly on things. But the Spartans had a completely different form of government, hosting two kings at one time. Another influential concept of ancient Greece was the idea of civic participation. And this is where citizens were encouraged to participate in their government. The polis Athens is the best example that we can use. And in Athens, they met in assembly, which was like a large group of citizens. And they would do things like make executive pronouncements. The people themselves would declare war if they decided that's what they wanted to do. Assembly was also responsible for electing officials, and they even acted as judge and jury trying political crimes in assembly. Not only did they encourage you to participate in government, but there were punishments if you didn't. The most hilarious of which is they would paint your clothes red if you didn't show up for assembly. 
Now, while I mentioned that they could elect officials, not everybody in Greece actually could. And this is another influence that Greece had on America. In ancient Greece, they had what was known as voting rights. These voting rights determined who could vote in elections, and it was a very small percentage of the people. Foreigners, slaves, children and women, and even men who did not complete their military training were not eligible to vote in ancient Greece. Mm. Many of the U.S. customs for voting originally started with similar concepts. Yes, when the country first formed, not very many people could vote. But we'll save that for another video. The last influential concept from ancient Greece is the legislative bodies. And when we say this, we are referring to the lawmaking body of government. Now, the Greek legislative bodies kind of did it all. Nowadays, we divide the powers of the government into other branches. But this singular branch of government in Greece and its citizen involvement were responsible for all manner of government functions. Okay, that wraps it up for ancient Greece, but the second culture that had a major influence on American government is that of ancient Rome. You can see here from the map that the Roman Empire was massive. They conquered so much territory, including Greece, which actually fits into the Roman Empire. Now you're probably asking, how did they get so much territory? And the simple answer is, they had a better military and better military tactics. Now, Rome kind of modeled their government after Greece, but they had to make several changes because of the sheer size of their empire. And one of those was republicanism, and we love this concept here in America. This is simply electing government officials to represent the people in government. Let's take a closer look. When you think about voting for something, you're probably thinking about direct voting, in which the individual votes on what they want directly, whether it's food or some kind of public issue. But in a republic, you do not vote for the individual things, you actually vote for people. And these people will represent you in government and make choices for everybody that they represent. Now the reason this works very well in Rome is because of the size of their empire. It was too impractical to go halfway around Europe asking everybody what they wanted. It was more practical to choose several individuals to represent them in government to make those choices for them. And oh yeah, by the way, in a large spread out empire with lots of different cultures and languages, it's really hard to communicate what we're voting on. Elected representatives would speak the Latin language and could communicate when they traveled to Rome to communicate what their representatives wanted in government. We have a very similar system here in the United States where we have a large spread out society and we elect representatives to represent us in government and travel to Washington DC to do their government things. You might also hear this term as representative government and not republicanism, but it kind of means the same thing, right? This is a government in which officials are elected by their people to represent their ideas and concerns. And this can include a president, a governor of a state, and even lawmakers. Now, the Romans also had their own civic participation that was similar to Greece, but kind of different. And again, all citizens were expected to take part and be active in their government. And they had to attend their assembly meetings where they would vote for local leaders. They could also run for political office because we are voting and electing representatives. You could be one of those representatives, although you kind of needed a little bit of money since the job didn't pay. So only the wealthy ended up doing this. Speaking of which, this caused a number of problems for the Roman society later on. And that's where we get to the rule of law. The rule of law is simply a concept. It's like an idea that everyone is accountable to the law. Everybody has to follow the rules, whether you're rich or poor. But in Rome, the average citizens who really didn't have enough money to run for political office found themselves in a great divide between the wealthy citizens. Laws in Rome created by the wealthy seemed to only apply to the poor people and the wealthy people were sort of above these rules. And so in an effort to bridge the gap and make sure both poor and wealthy had to follow rules, they created the 12 tables. And these were a series of civil laws that were created to not only apply to the poor people, but also to the wealthy. This is sort of a rebalancing of power in Rome where they all agree that everybody kind of needs to follow these rules. Otherwise, it's not a fun society to be in. And this concept has greatly influenced the US where we don't want wealthy people or famous people or people that work in the government to be above the rules of the common man. 
Another thing the Romans did that we loved was called separation of powers, and this is simply dividing the government power into different independent branches. Their separation of powers didn't look quite like ours did, but the concept is there, right, of limiting your government by spreading out the power. And finally, the Romans had checks and balances, which was the ability for each branch to sort of stop the other. The Romans created term limits for those who served in office, at least for the consul position, and they also had age requirements. They gave their branches veto power and even had two consuls in office just in case one of them went power hungry. Fast forward over a thousand years later and you see the United States government was influenced by Rome. And here's an example of checks and balances using our three branches. The main function of the legislative branch is to write laws. But they can't just pass laws on their own. After they write them, they have to be approved by the other branch, which would be the executive branch. The executive branch might either sign the bill into law, make it official, or veto the bill, which is a rejection of the bill. In this way, the executive branch can check the power of the other branch if they're creating laws that the U.S. really doesn't need or most of the people don't want. Now, checks and balances works both ways. The legislative branch also has the power to stop the executive branch. And the way they do this is a little thing called impeachment. If the president, which is the head of the executive branch, is doing something illegal, a federal crime, or just their behavior is improper, and you can't see my air quotes here, but I'm doing it, then they may be removed from office by the legislative branch. It takes a lot of doing, but it can be done, and it has been done before. And so we've taken these ideas from Rome, like checks and balances, and the rule of law, and these ideas from Greece, like civic participation and democracy, and we sort of modeled our government after these two older societies. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. We'll make more videos soon.